there's the whole issue of campaign planning. I mean, very uh, uh, current right now with, with the COVAX initiative, so vaccination campaigns, but obviously also uh, malaria, uh, uh, bed net uh, uh, distribution campaigns, all different kinds of campaigns which need to be planned and organized, uh, knowing where to bring how much of the stocks that you're distributing. Um, there's the whole issue of territories of responsibility, which health center caters to which territory, um, what population can you find in those territories, so how many people are being catered to by a health center. And um, then the whole big panel of monitoring and evaluation studies or, 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 or tools where a lot of time maps play an important role. And so in order to make the maps, you need the spatial data. So we need facility locations. We need the equipment and service availability in facilities. We need the territorial fit footprints and shapes of administrative entities within the health uh, sector, but also outside of it. And we need population distribution. So all these are the different types of of geospatial data that we are working on with governments in, in different countries. So um, what are the issues we see? Again, nothing new. I think uh, uh, Levin's presentation kind of showed the same issues. Uh, we are confronted with incomplete data. So you can see the example of health areas in, in, in DRC on the top left. We see a lot of problems with unstructured data. Um, so you can see uh, uh, on the bottom there that you will have data which where you have coordinates formulated in very different ways, where you have latitude and longitude inversed and all these issues that you see when you get uh, to the data uh, really into it. And often these are just you know Excel files which are on someone's computer and you have to access them and find them. And so it's a lot of unstructured data there. Um, a lot of incoherent data as well. So what you can see uh, on the top right is, for example, examples of health centers which are supposed to be part of a specific health area but they geographically actually fall outside of that area um, when you look on the the uh, map on the on the very right it's examples of taking three different sources and seeing three different versions of geometries of the health districts in niger and not knowing which ones are the correct ones for example so that's a lot of the very typical stuff we're confronted with when we work with with governments on on, on their data then there's the, the big issue of lack of capacity. Um, in most administrations, and that's true obviously all everywhere, but um, uh, maybe even a bit more in, in some of the poorer countries where this hasn't been the core issue and, or the, 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 the main preoccupation, uh, GIS capacities are just not there. Um, and you might find people who have had some one week training on, on some tools, but kind of the, the fundamental understanding of, of what uh, actually this geographic data can help you do what what how, what how to interpret the the results, how to translate questions that you might have into geographic analysis. All that is is not really there, which makes it sometimes also very difficult to motivate people to work on geographic data um, because they don't really see the the added value. Um, another issue in terms of capacity is that when you actually get people who who have had very good training. They often don't stay in the administration. I mean, and Lee even mentioned something also about, let's say, changes in the power structures, which, which make people move out. But it's also just the, the brain drain when you have people moving to better paid jobs in the private sector, often actually sucked up by the big international organizations or the companies from the richer countries. And then there's the big issue of lack of governance in the sense that very often we're confronted with administrations which don't really have clear responsibilities or ownership of spatial data. So you will have different versions of spatial data floating around and no clear uh, idea of which is the, let's say, the, the authentic source. Um, often you have the, the, the management of the same topics of spatial data divided between administration. Um, and if you actually have the situation of an authentic source or one administration which is really responsible for data, said they are often not very well equipped to, to maintain that data set. Um, and I think coming out of Nisera's uh, talk uh, earlier today is that obviously ve very rarely in the big efforts of, of collecting and creating data sets on the national level is there an inclusion of communities. And I think this is a very interesting point that she raised and, and that we will have to take on board as well in our future work. And there, there are a lot of existing efforts in collecting data. So um, obviously, this is great work done by OpenStreetMap and especially the, the hot 
uh, OSM team. Uh, you have work done by, by different agencies of, of the United Nations. You have the Grid3 consortium, which does great job in, in collecting data in, in countries very thoroughly and really creating great data sets. Um, a lot of the times, so though, the data collection efforts are ad hoc and they are just based on the immediate needs and often they're partial, partial in terms of territorial coverage or partial in terms of domain coverage. And um, so you really have to work with a patchwork of very different data sources. Often there's very high levels of redundancies, the same data being collected three, four or five times because there's no communication between the different agencies collecting it. At the same time, even when people are collecting the same data, it's often in different formats, not no harmonization, not exactly the same questions asked. So you can't really put this, these data sets together. Um, and there is generally very little data sharing, very little, little data integration. And this is something that we try to work on a lot. It's just getting all the different data sources together, finding out how we can pass them together and, and, and then work with that. The other issue is that structured efforts to really create spatial good spatial data are often very slow and costly. And so by the time you cover an entire country, um, you actually have to start over again at the beginning because you, you it's already outdated for the in the first regions you covered. And then, yeah, just I think Misera really raised some interesting uh, questions there. And so um, the question of data colonialism is, 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 is very, very present in all this ecosystem of data collection from international agencies. And um, I think uh, the there's a question I'm citing here that was in the chat during the keynote uh, today. Um, what can we as analysts and data consumers do to ensure that the data providers are fairly representing the whole population? And that's obviously a continuous uh, question. What is it we are aiming at? We're aiming at, as I said, integrating uh, geospatial data management into the daily operation of public administration, structuring the data, introducing the necessary technologies, obviously, but supporting also the productive use of that data. So getting actually information out of the data, supporting the data governance. So we're trying to really work a lot with administrations to get them together to, to, to talk to each other, um, just as Levin also mentioned in his example. Um, and really trying to, to closely link spatial data into routine health management systems. And for those of you uh, who know that sector, DHIS2 is the, database used in most countries for, for managing uh, health data. So this is something we're really working a lot with trying to integrate the spatial data into that workflow with DHIS2. Um, yeah, trying to build a coherent system, um, uh, trying to allow also administrations to leverage new data sources, which uh, are abundant but not easy to use. Um, develop local minimal effort data collection techniques. So efforts like community mappers is obviously very interesting there. Um, also trying to move away from these ad hoc campaigns to really introduce routine data collection systems for continuous updating. Um, and um, while doing that, also really pushing public administrations to open and share their data, which is a very difficult task as well. Um, and we use Phosphor-G exclusively working with, um, with the governments and we program necessary FOSS tools whenever necessary as well. So just a few examples of the type of work we're doing because I was quite abstract in what I described before. So here's an example from Cameroon in a project financed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, we're in a context of a country which is working strongly on a decentralization of health administration, giving the municipalities kind of the, the competency, the power to be responsible for all health policy on the territory. But the problem is there's no alignment whatsoever between the administrative hierarchy, so the, 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 the territory is defined for communes and, and, and municipalities, and the, um, the administrative hierarchy in the health sector. So you can see on the right, in black, uh, you can see the, the health areas, and in color, you can see the, the communes, and you can see this complete overlap, and there's no, I mean, uh, no easy way to fit one into the other. So that's a, a big challenge for them, and so we're working on that. A lot of work, for example, just cleaning the actual data set. So that's what you can see on the left. And, and you know, we created a targeted manual for them on how to use QGIS to do that. But there's also just a lot of work, theoretical work with the actors trying to make sure with the local actors, okay, uh, what health area is supposed to be in which uh, municipality and, 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 and these kind of questions. Another example is, um, this is in Niger, uh, financed by, by the Belgian Corporation Agency. 
uh, we're working on on helping them to 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 think about where to invest in new infrastructure. And um, since we've been working with them on the, uh, the, the their health map, so getting actually the health uh, infrastructure onto the map, now they want to go a step further and to use that information to actually do better planning. And so this is actually a work in progress right now. So this is just the first prototype that we used. Uh, that we use uh, created in grass and that we used for for initial discussions with them in order to really clarify what is it you want so here we used a, a world population and just getting uh, the population that is reachable in five kilometers in all areas that are not covered by existing health sites and just short kudos to to aaron's work in the gsoc project for grass just this summer which was really great parallelizing a lot of the raster modules and and so we could do this this work in getting this five kilometer radius population much faster than it would have been possible before another work we're really trying to work on is to say there's a lot of data collection out there a lot of health data collection and right now there's a big movement to digitizing health uh, campaigns and so collecting more and more data the problem is generally that data stays within the silos of the programs and the, the, the geospatial information that is contained in that data is not leveraged, not used, and not extracted. So here you have an example of uh, uh, a campaign that we're working on in, in, in DRC. Uh, the campaign is financed by, by USAID. And uh, in another project where we work uh, also financed by the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we, we try to leverage the data that is being collected in the USAID project. The USAID project is about collecting data on community health sites. And so there's there's a, a one shot let's say mapping, and then there's routine monthly routine re reporting on on stocks and, and on activity of these community health uh, workers. And so we we collect that data using our our own Yazo app, and from that we can now extract, for example, information on village local localization, something which is very difficult to have in in DRC. There's no coherent data set on village uh, locations in DRC, and so we we are now using this data collection, which is slowly being expanded across the territory to actually extract village data and village location. And in terms of data governance and sharing, for example, here's a, 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 an example of a project that we're doing in, in Niger and Burkina Faso, really trying to, to get this data extraction that I just talked about to a bigger level and to actually leverage, for example, data which is collected in health ministries or in other ministries, education, water, whatever, and to feed that into the national statistical system in order to be able to have, let's say, more up-to-date and more frequent updates of population data at very fine scale, which is then extremely useful for health campaigns, for example. So this is something we're working on, but this at this stage is really more governance than, than a technical issue, just getting people together around the table because this kind of a paradigm shift to, to share this kind of data and to build new data, data sets. And last example is, is work on leveraging new data sources. And so, I mean, we have an explosion of that, and many data sources are being presented these days at Phosphor G as well. Uh, crowdsourcing, um, obviously, OSM is doing a great job in getting more and more data out there. Um, but a lot of the Earth observation derived data, but also mobile phone data. So you have population data sets, building footprints, settlement footprints, land cover, raw imagery data. The problem is that a lot of the times the, 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 the people who could actually use them the most, have a lot of difficulties using, using them. And there's issues in coverage. A lot of these data sets have been pushed first in the rich countries. And so in a lot of the poorer countries, the coverage is not as good. Content, uh, um, often what is being mapped is not exactly what is needed. And so the, the, these are issues that need to be solved. Issues with quality and reliability. I did some quick checks of the, of the settlement footprints, for example, in, in Niger. And I found a lot of areas where we're at 50% of false negatives. So that's a big issue as well. Um, and accessibility of the data, just downloading some of these data sets is a huge endeavor in administrations where your, your let's say, average internet connection is still measured in, 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 in Ks and not in, in, in megabits. Um, and kind of linked into the question I raised earlier, the, the, the question of, 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 let's say, capacity of actually understanding how to use and how to interpret that data is often lacking as well. And so that's a big job as well to do, to, to really build up kind of uh, that, that, that capacity building. 
So just a short word on, on some of the tools that we specifically build. One is Yasso, which was actually presented earlier today in, 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 in the session, uh, in the morning session. Um, this is a, a, a tool really oriented towards the, the, the needs of, let's say, data geographical data management in a system like the health system where you have a very hierarchical territorial organization. And so this is um, uh, a tool which has a mobile component, so ODK-based uh, forms, uh, which work offline, obviously, but which actually into which you, you, you load, let's say, the hierarchy that you defined before. And so people navigate within that hierarchy and fill out their forms whenever they're at the right space in that hierarchy. And then the, there's a web component um, uh, which allows you to, to manage that data, compare different data sources, et cetera. And it's strongly linked, as I mentioned, to the DHIS2 database. So it allows to, to get data out of that and push it back into that. Another tool that, that we're working on is OpenHexa, which is a, a data integration platform which allows sharing, but also analysis of data. So this is used a lot in, in monitoring and evaluation. Um, but it, it's the, the aim is to really allow governments and, and ministries, health ministries in our case, most of the time, to have a platform which allows them to easily sh uh, share their data with different users while kind of keeping the, the control of who gets access to what. Um, so this uh, includes a lot of the actual health data, but also, um, which is often sensitive data, so you can't just share it openly, but also the geospatial data. And so this is a, a tool that we're working on with the, the data catalog, but also Jupyter Notebooks integrated into that, that allow immediate analysis also uh, using Python OR. Um, in that. So as conclusion, um, I mean, the first thing I think uh, that's kind of the why I asked the, the question earlier is also uh, why would you not teach with Phosphor-G? I think it's generally the only sustainable option, at least in the countries we are active in. And for having taught with Phosphor-G for the last 15 years, I think I, I really don't see any reason not to use it. Um, but a big question is there, and I think that's why maybe a, uh, an educational track at Phosphor-G would be great, is to, to have... The, capacity building, but really at a very, very, very large scale. We need more and longer training opportunities, including, for example, in our, with our public working in French, a lot of the training that is available is in English, but we need localized training opportunities. Um, and we need longer. So not only the one week or two week classical training in how to use Q just to make a map, but also really longer geospatial capacity building. Also locally organized, and I think there's some interest in local universities to build things up, but there's need also to for for support um, um, from actors like OSG or OGO for all. So I think that's something that we should slowly kind of really increase in terms of activities on the OSG side as well. Um, the other thing is there's a need for targeted continuous support and coaching. Obviously, you have the community mailing list and and, and Slack channels or whatever, but Maybe something like a mentor system might be something that we could uh, think about in, in the future. Um, also, I think that it's extremely important that while developing our tools and while trying to, to be bleeding edge and, and developing the coolest and the meanest, we should also keep in mind the very low hardware and connectivity standards that are uh, uh, usual in many countries. And so really, make sure that our software runs on hardware that is not as uh, uh, big and strong and performing as, as developers' hardware sometimes it might be. Documentation is extremely important. And there are also, in our experience, multilingual documentation. We can't just send people an English manual. It has to be in their local language. And so that is very important also to, to work on that. And I think this is something where people who are not developers can be really active in the community. To, to do translation of documentation and, and really help their videos are very useful as well. But again, uh, also with the question of, of accessibility in terms of connectivity. So kind of in as a really concluding statement is that working towards more data and more open data in especially geospatial data is not only about the technology, but it's a lot about the governance issues so getting access to talk together. And it's about creating a data maintenance and sharing culture, which is not in, there in many administrations. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Moritz. Uh, was really also interesting to see all the interlinkages between the different uh, presentations <clears throat> during this session. So obviously the organization team has done a good job here. 
Um, as for the questions, so there there is at least one question that uh, popped up already. Uh, that is, uh, what about data updates? Data which were surveyed by international organizations or NGOs tend to be abandoned without maintenance and update later on. Can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, that, that's exactly a, a, a problem that we have very often, that, that, that you see these ad hoc campaigns and, and then you have these great data sets uh, uh, which, which are being created and then... Uh, you have uh, just they just sit there and no one no one works on them, and and this is why what we're really trying to do is get this data into the routine systems, the routine systems that the ministries actually use, um, and and into routine let's say processes. That's why I said a lot of that work is not about the technology or the data itself. It's about the governance issues and about the maintenance culture, and so this is something that that that, that we're trying to work in and try to, to convince these NGOs and international organizations when they do a collection to then push that data into the national health system, which unfortunately is very often not the case. Okay, next question. Do you think 32-bit support is still important for OSG or software? Well, knowing that on the grass yes, side, we just decided to abandon it <laughs> a bit on the wrong side. I, I, I think that even in a lot of the countries that we work in, people have, are now on 64-bit, but I have been confronted with that issue during trainings, for example, when people are saying, oh, I'm not, I can't install uh, QGIS, and it's just because they were on very old hardware, very old uh, OS. Uh, so um, I, think, I think having at least the opportunity to have, to, I mean, always make available the old versions for download. So if people want to use them, they can still do that. Don't, don't hide them, don't throw them away, keep them available. I understand that it's difficult to always continue to develop uh, for very old hardware, but um, keep keep the old versions available. I think that, that can be very useful. Yeah, sounds good. Another question, so from my side there, um, we heard the term uh, data colonialism a couple of times during different uh, talks today. Another aspect of it is also um, data feudalism, which is sort of um, getting more and more important with the increasing amount of data that is sort of made available so that you get dependent on other um, proprietary or um, private actors that sort of provide services uh, on top of public data uh, to make it digestible so that, um, yeah, communities can get into sort of dependencies on these kind of private actors. Have you any thoughts about that kind of uh, problems? Do you sort of encounter that as well? I, I, I think that the danger is there and it is true in certain sectors. In the sector I work in, in the health sector, I don't see it as an immediate issue as most actors that, that are they're supporting the health ministries actually work on some form of open source software. Um, but we all also know that open source does not necessarily mean that there's an actual community behind that, um, that there's support there. But uh, what is quite interesting is that there's more and more tendency of the local governments to actually impose free and open source software and to impose that whatever software is used and is installed and whatever data is created is, is saved within the national borders. So that they that, that it's installed on their own data data in their own data centers that their own systems, but obviously if the capacity technical capacities aren't there, the dependency remains. So um, I, I I do see that as an issue. I don't see it in my daily work that much as as a problem. I see uh, with those administrations I work with, they they seem to have you know really understood the need for their own. A mastering of tools and data, so they, they're really trying to keep the, the control of that right now. Yes, so there are no more questions from the audience, but uh, please chip in more questions. We have a few minutes left. No. They will need their two minutes to switch rooms, maybe. Yes. So, but uh, thanks for the very interesting talk and uh, also 
please, uh, if there is a uh, wish for follow-up questions, please get in touch with Moritz um, on the different ways that are possible also within the venueless. Okay, thank you, Moritz. Thanks a lot, Stefan. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So now the next speaker actually has not entered uh, the studio yet. Um, I hope he will arrive uh, very soon.